Hi, my name is Elisa and I'm a technical support analyst on the Vertigus Studio team. In this Tech Tip video, we'll be going over some key concepts for making your forms more dynamic and interactive in Vertigus Studio workflow. Let's say we have a situation where the end user wants to enter the ID of a waterline, see what buildings are connected to it, and select a few of the connected buildings to be assessed further. A maximum of five buildings can be accepted by the assessment office per request, so there needs to be something in place that prevents the user from selecting too many. All this can be done using forms in Vertigus Studio Workflow. But for things to go smoothly, the forms must be configured to update and validate as the user enters information. In today's video, we'll be looking at how to set that up. As always, when building forms, we need to start with a display form activity. We want a form that gets the user to enter a waterline ID, then display options for addresses that are connected to that waterline. To do this, we could add an autocomplete element for the waterline ID and an item picker element for the addresses. If you're unfamiliar with either of these, check out our video on configuring common form elements in Vertigus Studio Workflow. To start, we can set the autocomplete element to perform an ArcGIS query on our waterlines layer. We'll get it to match and display the asset ID field. For the item picker element, we'll set it to perform an ArcGIS query on our buildings layer, which has a many to one relationship with the waterlines layer. We'll get it to display the full address field and return geometry. Now, let's try running this in the sandbox. You can tell off the bat that something isn't quite right here. Our item picker is showing a ton of addresses without us having even entered a waterline ID. On top of that, when we do enter a waterline ID, the options for related addresses don't change. This is because we didn't set up any dependencies when we configured our form. Back in our form editor, let's open our item picker sub workflow again. When we check the query, we can see that it's asking for all records. That is not what we want. To fix this, we'll replace the where clause with an expression that matches the building's waterline ID to the waterline ID that the user selects from the autocomplete element. There are a couple ways you can format this, so I will show you both options. The first option is to use something called string concatenation. Essentially, this uses plus signs to integrate your variables into your text. We will start with our first bit of text in double quotes. The field we care about is water line ID, and we want to add an equal sign and a single quote since this is the syntax that ArcGIS server expects when we're asking for exact matches that are strings. Now, we add a plus sign to say, add this next bit onto the existing text. We want the waterline ID from the autocomplete element, so we will need to add a reference to it, which always begins with a dollar sign. If you're unfamiliar with this, be sure to check out our tech tip video on collecting data from forms. We just want the text of the waterline ID and not the entire waterline feature, so we will use the label property instead of the value property. Now, we just need to add another plus sign, then a double quote, a single quote, and another double quote. This last bit just makes sure that the single quote we opened in the first bit of text gets closed on the other side of our waterline ID. The other option for formatting is to use something called template literals. This uses backticks around the entire string of text with special curly braces around the variables. In my opinion, it's a more visually appealing way of formatting things because your text doesn't get broken up by a bunch of plus signs and quotation marks. To start, we enter our backtick and the first bit of text is before. Now, we want to enter an expression instead of a string, so we will add a dollar sign and our special curly braces. Within the curly braces, we will add another dollar sign to enter a reference to the waterline ID from the autocomplete element. Now, we close the single quotes and end the whole thing with another backtick. When we run it in the sandbox, we no longer see a massive list of addresses, but also don't get any results when we select a waterline ID. Something is still wrong here. To fix this, we'll want to go back into the form editor and set the depends on property for the item picker to the autocomplete element. 
This tells Workflow that the item picker's value is determined by the autocomplete element and that the two are linked together. To handle the cases where no buildings are connected to the waterline, let's add a bit more to our form. First, we'll add a text element and set its description to no connected buildings, please try a different waterline ID. Since we won't know whether buildings are connected or not until after the user enters the waterline ID, let's toggle off visibility for both the text element and the item picker element so the initial view of the form isn't confusing. Now, we want to add some logic to handle whether to turn on visibility for the item picker or for the text element based on the ID that is entered. In this case, it'll be easiest to add this logic to the existing subworkflow that populates the item picker. Right after our query, we will drag in an if activity. We will set its expression to check whether the length of the returned list of features is greater than zero. If true, we want the item picker to populate, so we'll drag those activities to the true side. We'll also add a couple set form element property activities to toggle the visibility of our elements. The first one will set the visibility of the text element to false. Now, you may be saying, but the visibility is already off, which is a valid point. However, this logic will run every time the waterline ID is changed by the user. So if the visibility of the text is toggled on because they selected a waterline without connected buildings, we need to make sure to turn it off again. The second one will set the visibility of the item picker element to true. Since we're already in the item picker's sub workflow, we don't necessarily need to fill in the element property. It's up to you whether you want to or not. Now, let's copy-paste these two activities and swap their values. You could drag in fresh activities if you wanted to, but this is a bit faster. We'll connect them to the false side of the if activity to handle the cases where zero features are returned from our query. When we run it in the sandbox, we get a nice form that populates dynamically with addresses based on the selected features. If we zoom way out, we can even see the features highlighted on the map. To minimize the amount of zooming the user has to do, let's make it so the map pans to the selected waterline. To do this, we'll first need to edit the suggestion subworkflow of the autocomplete element and set its query to return geometry. Now, we want to add a change event to the autocomplete element. Events allow you to configure subworkflows that run at specific times. For example, load events will trigger when the form loads, Change events will trigger when the value of the element is changed, and so on. In our event subworkflow, we'll want to add a get form event data activity and the set map extent activity. We'll make the set map extent activity zoom to the current feature in the autocomplete element, which can be obtained from the value of the get form event data activity. Let's also include a clear graphics activity and an add graphics activity to highlight the waterline on the map. Finally, we'll need to add a propagate form event activity to make sure the stuff we just added doesn't interrupt the trigger that populates our item picker. Running it now, things are a bit smoother for the end user since they are shown the waterline associated with the ID they entered, as well as any connected buildings. Now, we want to make sure they select the right number of buildings to be assessed. In our form editor, we want to click on the item picker and set its selection mode so that multiple items can be picked. To assess whether too many buildings were selected, we'll want to add a validate event, which will fire when the user clicks a button that has the causes validation property checked. For reference, the submit button has this property enabled by default. On the validate event, we'll first want to make sure that at least one building is selected. To do this, we'll add an if activity that makes sure the item picker's value is not undefined using the double not operator. If no value is selected, we want to show the user an error. So we'll add a set form element error activity on the false side. Let's set its message to please select at least one building for assessment. On the true side, we'll add another if activity. We want a maximum of five buildings per request, so we'll set the condition to check the length of the list of selected items in the item picker and see if it's greater than five. On the true side, we want to add another set form element error activity. We'll set the message to maximum limit exceeded, please only select up to five buildings for assessment. 
For good measure, let's also toggle on the required property for the autocomplete element to make sure the user doesn't submit the form without entering a waterline ID. When we run it in the sandbox, we get an error message if we try to submit the form without entering a waterline ID. We also get an error message if we enter a waterline ID but don't select an address. And finally, we get another error message if we select too many addresses. At this point, we're done with the form, but there are still a few more things we have to do in the workflow. The most important thing is to remember that our cancel button doesn't actually do anything yet. We need to make sure we add logic that closes the workflow if the user clicks the cancel button. After the display form activity, we'll add an if activity. In it, we'll set the condition to check whether the result of the form is submit. For reference, this is based on the values of the buttons in the button bar element at the bottom of the form. On the false side, let's add an exit activity. This isn't strictly necessary since the workflow will still end even if it isn't there, but it's helpful for clarity and for guaranteeing that the workflow closes. On the true side, let's add a run workflow activity. The workflow we want to run is a server-side workflow that sends an email to the assessment office with all the features the user selected. Building the server-side workflow is beyond the scope of what we'll be looking at today, so we're pretty much done here. All we need to do is specify the URL to the workflow and include our user-selected features in the arguments. The arguments need to be formatted as key-value pairs in JavaScript object notation, or JSON for short. We start with an equal sign and an open curly bracket. Let's pick a key that makes sense, like selected features, and set its value to all the selected items in the item picker element of our form. Since we only have one packet of information to send to the server-side workflow, we can close our curly bracket. Let's add one final display form activity to let the user know that their selection of buildings has been sent to the assessor's office. We don't need a submit button, so let's get rid of it. Let's also change the cancel button to close so that it makes more sense. And that's it. We've successfully created a dynamic form that responds to what the user enters, validates their input, and passes information to the rest of the workflow. Hopefully, that helps you get started as you design your own forms in Vertigas Studio Workflow and offers you an example of how you can build intuitive tools that your users enjoy interacting with. If you would like to see more Tech Tip videos, don't forget to subscribe to the Vertigas YouTube channel. As always, thank you for watching.